The landing gear supports the aircraft during ground operations, takeoff and landing. The landing phase is the most demanding and defines the main design requirements. Hi, my name is Magna Nordal. I'm an ATA type rating instructor and airline captain. And this channel is all about aviation. Today I will talk about the landing gear on ATR aircraft. This video is intended to give you an oversight of the system. For a fully detailed description, please read the FCOM, the Flight Crew Operating Manual Description, Chapter 32. The main role of the landing gear is to absorb impact energy on landing. The certification requirement is that the main landing gear must be able to absorb a touchdown with a vertical speed of 600 feet per minute or 10 feet per second at maximum certified landing weight. The limiting g law depends on the weight. The heavier the aircraft is, the less g-force is accepted. For example, when an ATA-72 weighs 22 tons, the limitation is 2.3 g. We consider anything above 1.75 g to be a heavy landing. All ATR variants have a nearly identical landing gear system. The differences lie in the weight limitations, type and size of wheels and brakes, and tire pressure. The maximum takeoff weight is printed on a label attached to the gear strut. The landing gear is hydraulically powered and electrically controlled. The green hydraulic power operates landing gear retraction and extension and normal brakes. The blue hydraulic operates the nose steering and the emergency brake which also functions as parking brake. There is a link to a video describing the hydraulic system below. And this is how the landing gear extends and retracts. The landing gear is controlled with the landing gear selector. The landing gear cannot be retracted while one leg is on the ground. To move the lever up and down you must first pull it out a bit. The landing gear has two independent indication systems. System 1 is on the central panel and system 2 is the, in the overhead panel. Each system is connected to individual sensor that senses when the associated landing gear struts are locked in either up or down position. With the exception of ATR 42300 and 320, the indication systems are managed by the multifunction computer, MFC. A green triangle indicates that the associated leg is down and locked. A red unlock means that the associated leg is not locked, either up or down. No light at all means that the leg is up and locked, or the indicator doesn't work at all. Three green on a single panel is regarded to confirm that all three legs are down and locked. So you can have one red or more indication on one panel. If at least one leg is not down and locked, when the aircraft is below 500 feet on the radio altimeter with flaps 30 or at least one power level at flight idle, a landing gear not on alert is triggered. The tires are filled with nitrogen which has some benefits of a normal air. The pressure is more stable with temperature changes. And nitrogen is inert and suppresses fires. The tires have eight core layers and can be used until the first core layer becomes visible. Most of the tire wear happens when the tires are heated up. This happens during takeoff and landing. Heat is generated by friction against the runway and the brakes. The landing gear has an overhaul interval of 18,000 flight cycles or 9 years, whichever comes first. Each landing gear member has two wheels. The main reason for this is safety. The aircraft can land with one of the wheels damaged or even missing. 
This ATR-72 lost one of the nose wheels and the pilots didn't even notice it. The gear struts are secured in retracted and extended position by mechanical locks. This is the up lock of the left main landing gear. In case of electrical or hydraulic failure, the up locks can be released by pulling a handle located aft on the pedestal. The landing gear then extends with the assistance of gravity, aerodynamic forces, springs and gas actuators. The landing gear can also be secured in down position with a pin that is inserted into each leg. They are used when the aircraft is not powered and towed on the apron. The gear pins are stored behind the first officer's seat and we always check that they are in place before flight. The main landing gear is attached to the fuselage and retracts inwards into side pods and partially into the fuselage. This makes the landing gear very compact and saves weight when compared to similar high wing aircraft where the landing gear is attached to the wings. The main landing gear doors are attached to the landing gear struts. The doors don't cover the wheels. Instead, the outer wheels have a cover giving a smooth surface when the landing gear is retracted. This allows for the fuselage to be close to the ground, making it easier to serve the aircraft. The Boeing 737 has a similar arrangement because it was also designed to operate on airports with minimal ground support. The no-step text on the doors must be respected. In earlier days, some mechanics used to stay on the door when they drained the fuel tanks. The result was that the hinks become overloaded and failed. And this can be the result. Each main landing gear leg has two weight on wheel switches, which defines whether the aircraft is in the air or on the ground. The main wheel tire pressure depends on the max takeoff weight and is shown on a placard on the Oleo strut. Each wheel has a pressure relief valve that protects against overpressure. ATR-42 has steel brakes, while ATR-72 has carbon brakes. The brakes are engaged automatically when the landing gear is selected up. The brakes are operated by pressing down the upper part of the rudder pedals. Unless the runway is short, you barely have to use the brakes. Carbon brakes are lighter than steel brakes and, depending on operations, have a longer life, making them more cost-efficient. Furthermore, carbon brakes can absorb more energy than steel brakes. In my experience, operating on long runways, the carbon brakes last for about 800 cycles. Steel brake wear is directly proportional with the kinetic energy absorbed by the brakes. Maximum steel brake life can be achieved during taxi by using many small light brake applications allowing some time for cooling of the brakes between the applications. Carbon brake wear depends mostly on the number of applications. One firm brake application causes less wear than many light applications. Carbon brakes wear more when they are cold and they are hot. Maximum carbon brake life can be achieved during taxi by using small number of long, moderately firm brake applications instead of many light brake applications. However, unless you have a strong tailwind or a taxing downhill, you don't need to brake at all. You can control taxi speed by using the power levers in the range between ground idle and reverse. In most cases, I only use the brakes to slow down before a turn and when I'm going to stop. Each brake has a wear indicator. On ATR-42, it's a nut that moves into a cylinder as the brake is worn. On ATR-72, it's a pin. It also moves inward as the brake is worn. When the pin is flush with the housing, it's time to change the brake. Each brake has a temperature sensor, which triggers an overheat alert if the temperature exceeds 150 degrees Celsius. 
If that happens, you must avoid using the brakes, including the parking brake. If you are in the air, you must lower the landing gear to cool the brakes. Each main wheel is equipped with three fusible plugs that release the tire pressure if the temperature exceeds 177 degrees. Here is a video from Boeing showing maximum brake test with the 747-8. At the start of the runway, Captain Vining begins the takeoff roll as usual, pushing all four engines to maximum thrust. But just as the airplane is going at over 200 miles or 320 kilometers per hour, he slams on the brakes to channel maximum energy to the carbon brakes. The pilot cannot use the thrust reversers. The brakes, made by Goodrich, do exactly as they're supposed to. In fact, the 747-8 stops earlier than the team had hoped, beating the target by more than 700 feet or 200 meters. But stopping is just half the challenge. Now the airplane must prove it can withstand the tremendous heat that built up in the wheels, estimated to be more than 1400 degrees Celsius. As expected, smoke pours out from the brakes as they glow a bright orange. Still, the firefighters who are standing by can't do anything but watch for the next five minutes. The main brakes are supplied by green hydraulic power. The emergency and parking brake is supplied by blue hydraulic power. The emergency brake is fed by an accumulator that has capacity for at least six applications. The emergency and parking brake handle moves in a pattern shaped like the letter E. The forward position is off, the middle position is emergency, providing 500 psi pressure. This position prevents the wheels from locking. The aft position is parking, providing 3000 psi pressure. To prevent the aircraft from moving when the parking brake is engaged and the engines are running in idle, the pressure should be at least 1600 psi. On AFIS cockpit variants, the parking brake accumulator has a pressure indication on the center panel. On glass cockpit variants, the pressure indicator is on the hydraulic AC valve page on the MFT. The parking brake accumulator also has a mechanical indicator outside the hydraulic bay. In addition, glass cockpit variants have an indicator on the left-hand maintenance panel. It can be activated when the battery switch is off, which is very useful for maintenance when they have towed the aircraft and want to check the pressure before they engage the parking brake. The brakes have an anti-skid system which helps preventing aquaplaning and tire damage. The anti-skid is tested after engine start when hydraulic power is available. The duration of the test is 6 seconds on ground and 3 seconds in flight. During the test, normal braking is lost. The test is inhibited when the speed exceeds 70 knots. However, the parking brake should be engaged when you do the test. The anti-skid is active when the speed is about 10 knots. When the speed is about 23 knots, the locked wheel protection is activated. The system compares the rotation speed between inboard and outboard wheels and if the speed difference is 50% or more, the brakes are released. At main gear compression, the braking action is inhibited as long as wheel spin-up is below 35 knots or for 5 seconds. In order to prevent unplanned brake application on low friction payments or with light vertical loads on the wheels. The nose strut has an attachment point for a tow bar and there are two taxi and takeoff lights. The nose steering has an actuator behind the strut and is powered by blue hydraulic power. The nose steering can deflect 60 degrees to each side. The nose steering is controlled by MFC 1B and 2B. The nose steering has a hand wheel on the captain's side. It can be disconnected with a switch for pushback and towing. Then the nozzle can be deflected 91 degrees to each side, which is marked with a red line on the gear door. The nozzle is automatically centered when the aircraft is airborne. The nozzle retracts forward. 
there are four doors which are actuated mechanically by the gear. The forward doors are only open during retection and extension of the gear. However, the doors can be opened to give access to the bay for maintenance. The nose gear limits the retraction speed to 160 knots because it retracts against the wind. If you try to retract the landing gear at a higher speed, only the main wheels will retract. Finally, we have the tail bumper. It is attached to a shock absorber. It can protect against over-rotation, but not against heavy landings. The shoe is inspected before each takeoff. If there are scratches, you check the red indicators above. If the red indicators have scratches, you call maintenance, because this means that the bumper has been pushed all the way up to the stop. Okay, that's all for this time. I hope you enjoyed this lesson so much that you will share it with your friends. And if you haven't done it yet, please click subscribe and hit the notification bell. Then you will not miss the next videos. Until then, have a wonderful day and happy learning!